Believe it or not, this is the third Sunday of January. Time does really fly, doesn't it? If you guys been busy, if you guys been uh, sitting down and do nothing, time's really probably going slow. But uh, like it or not, time can move on and God's continue to work no matter what we do or we don't do. God is continuing to work because He is a God that always moving. God is always doing His business, that is to reveal Himself to everyone, even to all of us here today, especially. God always wants to reveal Himself in a very special way to individually, so that individuals will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally as well. A couple weeks ago, we began a new series on the book of Acts. So turn your Bible, if you would, to the book of Acts. And one of the things about the book of Acts that compels us to go through this, because uh, we've, been, we've been growing up in uh, so accustomed with tradition and cultures of church, churches. How many of you here, like me, grew up in churches, in church? How many of you? Can you please show your hands? How many of you grew up in churches? All right, most of you. Let me ask you this, how many of you did not grow up in church? One, two, only two? Okay, three, all right. So, those of you who grew up in churches, we have to be very careful in what we understand, what we think of church. Because it built in, in our system to be a part of a tradition, a man's tradition. And as a result of that, the true meaning of church, the true understanding of church, has been so vain, and that we do church as part of our rituals, and it become meaningless, become meaningless. I remember when I grew up, church was just something that my family did, and I remember if I don't get ready on Sunday morning, my dad will come out with a belt. And my dad, when he show his belt, it's not just to show it, but he's gonna use it, because there's something that needs to be done. I remember there was a few days that I did not ready, I was not ready for church. I remember my dad took me out of my bed, literally, with his arms, and put me into the, the shower or the bathroom. We don't have a shower at that time when we were growing up. We have what he called this little bucket, and my dad would just pour a bucket of water on my head. And I says, you need to be ready, boy. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know? And I did not fight my, fight my dad. I learned to respect my dad, and I learned to respect my parents, no matter what the circumstance was. But, deep in my heart, I grew up in church, knew all the churches, you know, rituals. Even my parents told me to memorize Bible verses because they have this competition to recite verses. That we have to go up in front of everybody and say verses, and if you can memorize how many verses, then you're going to get a reward. Well, the first reward, you get recognition in the church, and then your mom and dad's going to give you something at home. I remember that. I remember that uh, we had to memorize a, a, a prayer. We used to call it the Lord's Prayer, which what actually is the disciples' prayer. And I remember we had to recite also the, the, the Apostles' Creed, because those are things that we have to say in the beginning, uh, toward the end of the service. I remember we have to remember the doxology, the song. It says, Amen, 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 and all the end of that. That actually was my favorite song to sing in the church. You know why? Because when that, sang, uh, that song being sang, that means it's the end of the service. <laughs> I was excited to leave. But if you were like me, growing up in church, the value of the church had become so little to nothing. And then I remember when I was growing up, as I left home, not by purpose, because my family sent me all overseas to study. I started being like, you know what, I shouldn't go to church, my parents are not here. I remember the first Sunday morning, I was away from my family, I was overseas. I got up in the morning, I jumped up on my bed, getting ready to go to church, and I realized that my parents are not around. Guess what I did after that? I went back to bed. <laughs> I was like, you know, my dad is not here. But then the phone rang, I was like, oh, I think it's my dad calling. I know it was my flatmate's parents call. I was like, oh, I got this consciously in my back of my head to do church, to go to church. If I don't do those, I can picture the anger, the wrath of my family, my parents. 
How many of you have that kind of picture in the back of your head? Okay, some of you can understand that. Through the centuries, the history of churches, there are many things that have happened. Churches have become more political. Their churches become part of the governmental you know, system. Where churches also have become something of a charity. Just for people to look for some kind of hand me, uh, give me something or help me out. You know, become a center of that. Church have changed through the years and becoming more just like a symbol. A church is like a symbol. How many of you have had thought like that in your life? And then, when you come to church like this, this morning, that's your attitude about church. You're thinking like, oh, I'm just going here because it's uh, you know, the things to do from back in the island, or from where I come from, or my country and all that. My family do this and I have to do this too. It's just to pay respect to my family. You're missing out everything about what church is about. The church began with the Lord, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was God organization. It was God organism. God put it together. It was not man that put it together. Church was never man's idea. If it's man's idea, it will not be church. It would be clubs. It would be amusement park. It would be movie theaters. It would be all of that for entertainment's sake. Nothing about religions. But Today, we're going to endeavor, continue endeavoring in the book of Acts, where the church, the first church, they call it, the first believers, where the Lord Jesus Christ put the church together. The book of Acts, as I mentioned before a couple weeks ago, was written by a man named Luke. Interesting about this man named Luke, Luke was a physician, he was a doctor, and he was not in the original part of the 12 disciples, if you call it that way. He was a Gentile by, by, the, uh, by the study that I had. He is a, he's from Antioch. He's a descendant of uh, Antioch of Pisidia. He was a Greek descent. In other words, that he did not grow up in church. And more than that, he also became the assistant. He was the assistant to a man named Paul, later on known as the Apostle Paul, to, bring, uh, to go with him because of the, the health issues that Paul was having. But through the journey in there, Luke, the doctor, learned something that made him to leave his profession. To leave him at, leave his work, his job, if you can call it that way, as a doctor. And commit his, life, his whole life to the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was something that he discovered that we, if we study the book of Luke and then continue to the book of Acts. Just told you so, uh, those two books. And then you look at what Luke really experienced, what Luke has been exposed, that made him to write this particular letter called the letter of Acts. Most people say that the book of Acts, it, it comes from, the title comes from the Acts of the Apostles. But I more believe when I study the book of Acts, as you read it, it's more of the Acts of the, the, the Holy Spirit, the Acts of God. Because God is the one who lived and moved in the being of those, the apostles, the people, that, the disciples, what we call it, of Jesus Christ. And so as we study this book of Acts, as we go through these messages, I want you to back, put in the back of your mind this. Alright? Put in the back of your mind of this. I do not want to be influenced, as I hear the, hearing these messages, I do not want to be influenced by my past experiences about churches. I don't want to be influenced in my head of what the churches around me is about. I want to just focus on what really the Bible says, what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say about church. Can we do that? Yes? Alright. When you do that, like what I did, and I said, stop studying this. You are seeing something perhaps you've never seen before. That church is not an organization. I'm going to say this again and again until you get this really engrafted in your heart, in your forehead, or in your brain. That church is not man's organization. Even though there are organized like organizations in the church, but church is, watch this, is an organism, is a living being. Church is not about this building right here. The church is not about just a place of meeting. The church is about the individual's 
bodies of believers, members, individually, who have been born again in Jesus Christ that God has put together. Yeah, I know the understanding today, a lot of people say, like, you know what, I like that church because the music is cool, because there is a laser in it, and because they have a really good coffee. <laughs> I met a guy named Steve Burgess, who is a member of IBC Danimora now. He's been there for a few years. But he told me, I asked him, I said, where did you go to church? But the first time I met him, he was just, uh, you know, like vision. He was working in the house, and I was witnessing to him, and he told me, he's like, oh, I go to the church in the city. I'm not going to mention the name of the church. But then he, I said, like, why do you go to that church? He said, people told me about a good coffee they had. <laughs> and I went to that church the first time, and I sit in the very front, because when I get there, the back seat's all full. And I didn't know why, but when the first service I attended, at the end of the service, when the when the congregation is singing hallelujah, amen, 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 people are already disappearing from the back seats. Why? Because they were lining up for the free coffee. And the coffee was so good. So guess what? The next Sunday, he and his wife learned, he and him and Anne says, like, you know what? We're going to go to church at 7 o'clock, so we get the very back seat, and then we get the first one in the line. <laughs> Maybe we should start something like that. Eh? No, I'm just kidding. Serve in the front, yeah. But you don't understand this. People don't understand the, the true meaning of the church, and church just become an attraction. Church just become like an entertainment to get the crowd in. I'd rather have a handful of people that truly love the Lord and sold up for the sake of Christ than having a bunch of people just to be entertained. Because the power of God can be revealed even in a small number of people who are totally sold out for Christ, like these disciples in the early days. But look at the impact they have made in there. So without further ado, let's dig into this. Let me remind you the first, uh, the first one and the first part of the message that we learned from chapter one, verse one to eleven. We discovered three things of the origin of the church, the origin of the church. The first thing that we discovered, first of all, that was the, 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 the foundation of the church, which is the infallible Word of God. The foundation of the church, let me say it again, the foundation of our church is the infallible, infallible Word of God. Infallible means that never, there's no mistake, it's proven through and through, it is true, always and faithful. Is the Word of God, the foundation. And then we also discover in the first 11 verses that the, the, that the force of the church, the force of the church is the Holy Spirit. The power of the church is not in the money. The power of the church is not in the positions or the, uh, the possession of the church, of the individuals, but is in the power of God, which is in the Holy Spirit himself. And then we discover lastly, that the, 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 four, uh, the, uh, the revelation of the church, the revelation of the church is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what, uh, what motivates the church to continue to meet together, to continue to do the work of God because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, is coming again. As we find out in there in verse 11 chapters and verse 11 verses that the Lord Jesus Christ has ascended to heaven and then the two angels appear before the disciples it says, man of Galilee, why do you look up into the sky? Why do you look up into the heaven? Because the same Jesus is saying, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so, will so lay in like, in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He's going to return again. And you want disciples to not have to ponder about this. Like, is that true? Is that going to happen really? Because they have seen the first coming. They have testified the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they have no doubt at all that Jesus Christ will come again. So here's the thing, church. How real is the second coming of Jesus Christ truly in your mind, in your heart? How real is that? Because if the second coming of Jesus Christ is not real, then there is no way, there is not, there, there is nonsense for you to be here really every Sunday. Well, Pastor, you're just going to kick some crowds out of the church. No, I'm just being true and true with you. I don't know about you, but I got sick and tired of playing church a long time ago. Because church really is the body of Christ. I'm not fooled that I have to give up all the business future that I had before to give my life to serve the Lord like this. 
Because what I found in Jesus Christ is not business, it's not something that I only can gain in, in here on earth, but it is the life, eternal life, and knowing the God, the Creator who made all these things, including my life. And serving the Lord, there's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. You hear me? That. And so here it is, the Lord Jesus Christ continue to work, getting the church ready in the foundation of it. So now we're going to go into the second part with this part right here. We're going to look at verse 12 to verse 14 today. Only these three verses. Verse 12, verse to verse 14. Let's read it with me if you would. In verse 12. Then they, the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. There were a total of 11 of them. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Shall we pray together? Father God, in the next few moments that we have here together, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in your power according to your will. To work in our minds and our hearts to give us understanding, not just an understanding for knowledge's sake, but God, the understanding that will change our lives. To see more of the glory of Jesus Christ truly, that He is the living God. And Lord, I pray today that we will not be the same as we leave this place, because we have known what truly church is about more than before. Because you have spoken to us today through these verses that we are looking in. God, I pray that you would empower me once again to deliver your word. And I pray, Father, that I will not hinder what you want to speak today, this morning. God, have control over this room. I pray that every mind and every heart will submit to you for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Confession to you, I was going to preach the next, I mean, all the way to verse 26. But then I realized we have children in here. So I know it cannot stay too long. So uh, let's just go through these three verses. It is powerful and then you're going to find. We're going to look at the divine fellowship of the church. You should have your bulletin. Inside your bulletin you have a handouts. I would like to encourage you uh, to get a folder. And then at home you collect all of these studies that you have made. Okay. Uh, if you want to say like pastor I want to get a copy of the full message. Uh, feel free to email me. I'll send you the whole message. It doesn't cost anything, you know, and freely receive, freely given. And so for your sake to study it again. But write this down, uh, all of this point, it's not much to write, but take a note of this. The divine fellowship of the church. The divine fellowship of the church. The begin, we begin with this, before the Lord Jesus Christ was ascended into heaven, He commanded His disciples to wait for the promise of the Father. So remember this, imagine we're in the shoes of the disciples. We've been following the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years. We have seen Jesus being arrested. We've seen Jesus being on the cross. We've seen Jesus died and he was buried. And we have seen Jesus with our naked eyes. He was risen from the dead. And then we have spent 40 days with Jesus so far. And imagine this, suddenly the Lord Jesus Christ, while he was talking to us, the Bible said that he was caught up, he got caught up into the heaven. He is suddenly being lifted up into the sky, and then the cloud receive him, and then we see him no more. Now, if we were that way, if we were to look at Jesus that way, what was the first thing that came to our hearts? We might say, like, wow, that's wow, that's what I cannot describe it. This is great. Our Lord has been ascended now to heaven. But the next thing that hit our mind, I believe, is this. What's next? What's next? I have friends of pastors, uh, churches, that told that I have heard when a pastor died or when a pastor got really ill, a lot of times the church scattered or the church is just kind of dwindling down. Why is it? Because people have a habit to follow after what is more material and physical 
rather than what is spiritual. Let me say it again. People have a habit, we have a habit, to follow what is, to see what is physical and materialist, is, uh, materialist, materialist than what is spiritual. You know, we got bogged down so much with a lot of physical things about church, don't we? Something to learn about this, in this part of the two verses we just learned. You know, we just read. Too many Christians rest their faith, rest their faith in a building, in re religious rituals, in men's traditions and cultures, and even in the man himself. Remember Paul, apostle, wrote the to the church of Corinth? And he said, like some of you say, I'm of Apollos, I am of Paul, I am of Christ. And Paul didn't like that. Why? Because like, why do you have to follow people? I mean, yes, God put individuals in the, each body of uh, church to lead the church in the spiritual things. But it always to point out to God. Guys, let me ask you this. ABC Central, whose church is it? Thank you. I hope that none of you say it's Pastor Irwin's church. Because if you say it's Pastor Irwin's church, something terrible is going to happen tomorrow with me, for sure. <laughs> I hope that I've told you enough that the church of ABC Central is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is the head of the church. That He is Christ. So when people come to me and say, Pastor, uh, Pastor, what is what this? I have to make sure that I give a counsel that is of the Word of God. That is from God's wisdom. That I rely upon the Holy Spirit, not based upon my intellect, not because of my business background, obviously because of my marketing degrees. Nothing about that. But it is because of Christ. And God works far way beyond our understanding, my understanding. So church, we are to truly rest our faith in Jesus Christ and His Word. God's Word. So think about this. The genuine faith of the believers, disciples in, in here. Do you remember? Do you see that in verse 13? They said that they went, they entered, they went up to the upper room and they were staying. Notice I underlined those words. They returned and then they entered, they went up into the upper room where they stayed. They, together. What does that mean? It's a fellowship. It's fellowship. Listen to this. The fellowship of the body of Christ cannot be neglected and cannot be ignored. Don't ever teach your children or show your children that church is about just attending. Because that is a huge mistake for the next generation to understand. Church is life. Church is my life. Yes, if you have a job in a secular job, still church is life. Why? Because it's the body of the living Christ. And Jesus Christ is the head. Who am I worshiping? I worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Take your time with me if you would. In first, uh, in Colossians. Turn your Bible to Colossians. It's not in the street. This is something that I've thought all day this morning. Colossians chapter 1. And I want you to look at, with me, in verse 16. Alright, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Do you have that? Say amen, if you have it. Alright. So I'm going to read it out loud. I want you to look at your Bible. Ready? Here we go. First, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by Him, Him that's Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven, they are on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, that's talking about earthly thrones, earthly dominions and principalities or powers in the heavens, is that all things were created through him and for him. Let me say it again. This is the Bible says, all things, everything, were created through Jesus Christ 
and for Jesus Christ. You and me, we are created for Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ. The trees, the chicken they eat, the birds, everything that we have on earth, this all creation that God made is by Him and is for Him. Now, it's easy for us to say to read this, but what's reality? Let's see. There's a market over there going on right now. That's the, people over there, they don't think anything for Christ or from Jesus Christ. They think that those things that I earned that, I bought it, now it's junk to me, I'm selling it. And I want more profits. What's the profit for? For me, so I can earn more money to do what I want. Do you notice that that is the mindset of people that do not know God? That is the mindset of a prideful people that say like, you know what, there is no God. But here's the thing. Look at the next part of that verse, verse 17. And He, Jesus Christ, is before all things, and in Him all things consist. I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. All things consist, meaning that in everything, without the presence of God, no one, nothing can exist or can stay alive. Remember I told you that Jesus Christ, even the presence of God is even everywhere, even in the pubs, but it's not manifested, it's not revealed. Because if the Lord Jesus Christ, if God is not present in those pubs, there's no one can breathe and live. Because all things, everything consists in Him. Now watch the next part of this, verse. verse 18. And He is the head of the body, the church. Underline that in your Bible. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in all things he may have the preeminence. You know what that means? The church was never designed just for a social gathering. The church was supposed to be the testimony of the living God in the world. Did you get that? Remember I said to you, if people ask you, where is Jesus Christ today? You point it to the church. If you got unbelievers, it's like, you know what? I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I say, Mike, let me tell you this. I can show you where Jesus is. Oh, really? Where is it? Come with me this Sunday. I'll buy you breakfast at 7 o'clock. I'll pick you up from your home. We'll go to McDonald's or whatever. Get something, and then I'll take you, and I'll show you to where church Jesus Christ is. You know what people should experience when they come to here? They should see the body of Jesus Christ fellowship together, moving together. They went together. They spent time together. They worked together. Have you ever seen like that before? Sometimes it's a shame that church is only an individual or a few individuals, not the whole body. I pray that none of our these essential members here that have an attitude that just like, you know what, I'm just going to church. Instead of saying, I am part of the church. I am the body of Christ. That I want to be there because it's Christ who am I serving, who I'm worshiping. Why, why, do I do, why, why did I do what I do today in my life for the last 20 years serving the Lord? It's not because of job. Ministry is not a job. If it's a job, I already left this job many years ago. I'll be honest with you. People are hard and stubborn. Right? But I've seen the power of God moving in people's lives that keep me doing what I'm doing because I depend on the power of Jesus Christ. And what I do is not a job. What I do is a calling. To me, it's the highest calling that anyone can have to serve Jesus Christ, my Lord, my God. And I take this, that in serving the Lord Jesus Christ, I cannot rest upon my own physical abilities. I cannot rest upon my own wisdom and my own intellect. If I do that, I already burned out many years ago. I rest upon the power of Jesus Christ. I rest upon the power of the Holy Spirit. I rest upon the Word of God. Man, I tell you, when you see those things, your life, church, will not be the same. But why all of that for? Here's the reason why. Because Jesus Christ is to be the preeminence. 
In other words, listen to this. There is no, there is no nothing on earth. There is no living things that is above the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the preeminence. Do you understand this? Yeah, we see those skyscrapers, those tall buildings, businesses on the 50th floor or whatever it is. That's the building. But the power is nothing compared to the power of the living Jesus Christ. And yet it is a shame that in our culture, that church is like a hole in the wall. And that the worldly domain is up there and with the, all the gold and silver. Why is it? Because that's a sign to say that more people are worshiping the wrong gods than the true God. But don't grow weary. I'm not going tired of this. Because what's amazing is that God used the small thing, the foolish things of the world to confine the wives. God worked in a way that no man can understand. And God can confine only anybody out there who want to challenge Him because there's no one like God. So for us Christians, IBC Central members, the church should be the preeminence above all other things, above your jobs, above your homes, above all of that. Do you understand that? That is why Amy and I, we serve the Lord together with our family. On Sunday morning, guess who is in the highest place? Jesus Christ. I don't have to set up with a whip and say, get up girls, you know, gotta go to church. I don't have to, why? Because they understand from our lives that we serve the living Christ and He is above all else. Church members, let's live in that way. Fellowship of the body of Christ. Now, as I said to you, I cut the message halfway. So in this next verse, verse 14, I want you to see something that is so powerful that I've never discovered this before. And I want to take you there. And I, I, I think this was funny. I didn't even read any commenta commentaries. <laughs> and this is something he just, God truly brought it up. And I want you to see this with me. Three things, really quick. Look at verse 14 with me. Verse 14 begins like this. These all, these talking about the disciples, all continued one in, with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, if you read that just like that, you may think like, okay, so what? I want you to see something that's so powerful in this. First thing I want you to see is the perseverance of the fellowship. The perseverance of the fellowship. Watch what happened in this. Not perseverance of the saints. Okay, that's another message. That is not. Agree with Okay. <laughs> perseverance of the fellowship. Watch what it says. These all continue with one accord. Underline that word continue and underline the words one accord. Some people say that's the first car in the world ever invented. One accord. I don't believe that. Okay. These all continue with one accord. Every true believe, true believers of disciples of Jesus Christ should have a great desire to get together or to fellowship with one another in Christ. The first disciples of Jesus Christ understood the value and the necessity of fellowship that the Lord Jesus Christ had put together. The disciples remember, I want you to think about this for a moment. The reason why they fellowship with one another, church, this is this should be us, is because of the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ before he was arrested and crucified on the cross. Turn your Bible to John chapter 17. I want you to look at with me the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 11, chapter 17, and on the screen behind me, you can see it. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed like this. This is his word. Now I am no longer in the world. But these are, these we're all talking about the 12 disciples and the women that follow the Lord Jesus Christ as, as well, the disciples. But these are in the world. And I come to you, God the Father, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be, look at the word, one as we are. Who's we are? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. 
There are one, one God. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, pray that you would keep all of these individuals as one as he is and he, he God the Father. Guys, church is more than just a family. Church is a one living organism. Do you call your arms and your legs a family of your body? No. When you show your hand like this, and nobody see him about the part of your body, you still say, oh, that's the hand of Irwin. When you see a leg going like this, oh, that's Irwin, yeah, that's Irwin. You don't say like, oh, that's leg, oh, that's hands, you know? There is an identity that attached to the person of the body. We are not just family, church. We are one. Because we have the same God, one God, one faith, one hope. That's Jesus Christ. One. Did you get that? You are here not because you signed up to be a member of the church. You are here, I pray, because God has called you to be a part of this church. The next time before you think about moving or going places or anything that way, think about this. If I believe, will I harm the body of Christ? Will I cause the body of Christ to limp? Because if someone cut your leg off, I bet you that you're not going to walk like this. You're not going to run like that. You'll be like that. You'll limp. People that come and go to the church, they don't understand that when they were being a part that Jesus Christ had put it together and they just leave for whatever reasons, because of themselves, not because God sent them, is they literally, literally amputated a member of the body of Christ. Does it hurt? Yes, it does. It hurts. Is it painful? Oh, you know, bet. Is it glorifying God? I don't know. I have a mission, not really. The body of Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ who put together. First Corinthians chapter 12, you can read that in your own spare time. And Romans chapter 12, you see that, how the Lord Jesus Christ put his body together. But here the Lord Jesus Christ pray. Look at verse 20 of John 17. He continues, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those. Now those is us today. So here the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? He only prayed for our church today. And he said this, listen what he said. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. The word of who? The word of the apostles. That they all may be, what's the word? As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. The fellowship of the church is the testimony of your unity and my unity with my Lord Jesus Christ. So people that don't want to go to church, we don't have to force them. Why? Because they're not part of the body of Christ anyway in the beginning. But we who have been saved, we who have been delivered from our sins and been brought into the light of Jesus Christ, we are the body of Christ. It should not be an obligation to go to church or to be together in fellowship for any reasons. Birthdays, whatever it is, together, why is it? Because it's the body of Christ. Can your hand say, like, you know what, I feel like I'm going to rest today so the whole body can go. Can you do that? You walk like this. Hey, what's going on? I don't know. What's your hand? <laughs> I don't know. Tired, you know? Been working all day on the left hand, so right hand, gotta do something, you know? If you're lefty. Is it like that? No way. Think about the body of Christ as God put it together as a body, through a body. And then continue in that verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. Do you hear that? The glory of Jesus Christ has been given to us. Do you understand what that means, the glory of God in us? It's like this. If you have a king right here, a literal, physical body of a king, and the king comes to here, and the king says like this, I doubt you all here today, that you're going to be my representation, that you will have access, direct access to me, and that you will have direct access to my wealth and my power. And whenever you go anywhere, say my name, show them the ring that I give you, <laughs> yeah, to show them that you have my power, what is that going to be in your life? 
Man, you know what? It's going to be elevated so far high that the glory of that king will be upon you and me. But here's the thing. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, have given us, he said, I have given them my glory. It's a shame for us when we treat the church like a men's organization to show forth men's glory but not God's glory. It's all about God's glory. Do you understand that? He has to be God's glory. It's all about Him. I pray that will be in your mind and your heart. Verse 23. Oh, sorry, verse 22. Look at it. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one as we are. Say it again, as we are one. Do you understand how many times that one word is repeated? Continue, verse 23. I in them and you with me, that they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The fellowship of the body of Jesus Christ, look at the last verse 23, is a testimony of Christ alive and His love that has been perfected. What's the world need today more than money? Love. True love. Not talking about lustful love. Not talking about I love you because. The world is so hunger and thirst for that love that is unconditional, that love that is undeservable, the love that is only come from Christ because He is love. That's what the world needs. Do you agree with that, church? Why am I just talking to an alien? <laughs> Think about that. The perseverance of the fellowship of the body of Christ, the church, is so valuable and so important to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why He died for the church. How important do you think to God is the church? Very. In John 17, in there, the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ was probably ringing in the ears of the disciples after He was ascended and they're all together. For what reason? Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, that they may be one to testify the living Christ. Watch this, listen. In the book of Hebrew, the author also emphasizes the importance of God's people to persevere in the fellowship. This is very common verses that you may have read before. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. It says this, Let us draw near with a true heart in a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the, an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with the pure water. Let us hold fast, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. That's God, Jesus Christ. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of our, ourselves together as in the manner of some. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ return is approaching. In those verses, without going in depth study, three things that it mentioned in there. First, it said the testimony of the church is a testimony of a true heart that is full in full assurance of faith. Why do we go to church Sunday mornings? Because to show that our faith is faithful and true. To whom? To those around you who do not believe in Jesus Christ. When your neighbor is like, Christianity, Christian, what is that? They're stupid people. Well, yeah, they're not wrong to say that because they have seen too many stupid Christians. They're playing church, pretending to be church. On Monday and Friday, they, all they hear from the house is like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> there's no love, there's nothing, it's just like, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, that's Christian. I better go to the beach. My church is to the beach with my thought. You know? But if it's truly the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and you are a part of the body, your testimony should be not like that at all. It's about the true faith assurance that my faith in Christ is sure. The second thing is that God's faithfulness to God's word and His work. That's the testimony of God's word and God's work. When you go to church, why do you go to church, man? Your neighbor asks me. It's like, because man, 
my God is doing something today. And I'm a part of that work that God is doing. I am the product of the power of the Word of God. And that may be your neighbor is like, too. <laughs> That's deep, man. And it's amazing. You don't have to understand it. But if you want to see it, come with me. I'll show you. And church, when those people come into the doors, they better be greeted by all of us, ready for it. <laughs> Commercial break. <laughs> Do you understand that? Church, let not have people to wait. You know, it's a shame when people come into the church and they have to wait for the members to come later on. How about us ready to show them the living Christ moving together? The last one, the testimony, the body of Christ is the testimony of God's love and His works of grace. That is truly evidence in the life of God's people. If God's really working in your life, then that should be showing every time we get together. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever you get together. You know what's really cool? I like to go when, uh, when some of you are having a birthday party or something like that. I like to go. You know, not because I like partying. <laughs> Because I like for the people around them that you invited that do not know Christ to see the body of Christ together. You get that? Can you imagine? You know, let's say the Lavao is having a celebration and then Eddie is the only one there. And then he says, Where's the Lavao? Right here. <laughs> it's like, dude, <laughs> really? But imagine this when people come and they see the whole family together in there. And greeted them together. What is it? Like, how does that gonna affect you, people that visit you? You're like, dude, man, there's something about this family. This is awesome. Man, why can't we do that? Why can't we show that to the world? That we are one. As God the Father and Jesus Christ are one. The love of God. The next one is the prayer of the fellowship. The prayer of the fellowship. Notice that in verse 14, continuing, it says, These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. Prayer and supplication are two of the same thing. Let me say it again. Prayer and supplication are two of the same entity, the same thing. Let me just give it to you this way to make you understand. Too many Christians, they don't understand what prayer really is about. Too many times when we pray, say, Dear God, thank you for this food. Thank you for the money you give for this food. Blessed Lord, Amen. Nothing wrong about praying like that if you are 5 to 10 years old. <laughs> How about this? I want you to turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, when the Lord Jesus Christ taught that prayer to His disciples. It's not to pray, not to, to say that this is what you should pray. It's supposed to be about how to pray. This is not a prayer that you just go in your every day and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And you're repeating it like a chant. No. But the Lord Jesus Christ shows something in here about how to pray properly. Prayer and supplication. You ready with this? First thing I want you to see. Prayer, prayer must consist of praise and acknowledgement of who God is. Look at the prayer. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. And now the word is saying, what Jesus is saying, that when you pray, make sure you acknowledge that there is no one like you, God. There is no one like God. And God is set apart from anything else. That God is to be supreme above all things. That God is the preeminence above everything on earth. That's how you approach God to the throne of God. Too many times we come into God so casually. Say, hey, what's up God? Here's what I want. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You go like that to the prime minister, you probably don't get through the door. Pray to God. Acknowledge Him for who He is. Second, desire for God's authority to be fulfilled in our lives as it is in heaven. When you pray, you got a desire for God's authority to be fulfilled. 
So many times in prayer, the authority is ours, and then we want God to sign it off. Say like this, God, I need a job, but I want this job so badly, I don't want that one, I don't want that one, I want this one here. So God, could you please seal the deal for me? Whoa, ho, ho. If I were God, I'd be like, hey, dude, who's the God here? And you think you know everything? You think that this job is yours? Dude, you are mistaken. You are delusional. Let me tell you this. I know what is ahead of you. I know when you're going to die from this earth. I know all of that. So why don't you just leave it to me? You remember the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ when He prayed in Gethsemane? Do you remember that? He was about to go through this hard press persecution. That's why Gethsemane means press. All the press. And he was about to be so depressed that he was going to die. That God has to die. But what is his prayer? His prayer is not like this. Dear God, send me the millions of angels, the legions of angels. And just kill all of these guys. And show your power to them that I am God. Did he pray like that? No way. What is his prayer? He says, let this cup pass me by, but not my will. But your will be done. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Lord, I know this is what I want. But I want your will to be done. That's why the prayer in the Lord Jesus Christ said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, in this life, as it is in heaven right now. That's the second thing that must be in your prayer. The third thing, desire for God's provisions of our physical and spiritual needs. Desire God's provisions. Sometimes we pray to God, but hoping for the boss to do something, right? Have you ever prayed like that? Remember the story I shared with you a long time ago? A little child praying with the mom upstairs in the room. And then she prayed like this, Dear Jesus, I want a bicycle with the pink color and the white wheel. And then the mom says, Dear honey, Jesus is not deaf. You don't have to pray so loud. He says, I know Jesus is not, but the grandma downstairs is deaf. You know what that means? She was not asking for, for God to give bicycle. She was asking grandma downstairs to give bicycle. So many times we pray like that, don't we? The Lord Jesus Christ said, when you pray, go to the closet, shut the door. Because the God who is in secret will bless you publicly. You know, too many times we pray to God, say, God, I'm depending on you and rest upon you. I know you're going to provide for my needs. But then you go out there after you pray, and then you say, hey man, do you have anything for me? You know, God going to heaven is like, uh, did you just pray with me? And sometimes we debate with God, say, oh God, you give me brain to work. Yeah, your brain, but your brain don't understand what my will is for your life. Your brain cannot see the future five minutes from now. You don't even know what's going to happen an hour from now. I know your future. I know way ahead. And why don't you just truly rest upon me? That's why in the Bible, if you ever study this, if you haven't, I want to ask you this. Do a word study. Look at the word wait, the phrase wait upon the Lord. Study that from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Do you understand what wait upon the Lord means? It's to wait for God to do His work before you move to do anything else. Too many times people are like this, oh, I want to go move there. Why? Oh, because I have a good school over there. They don't even think about, is God over there? And then they move there, they do things, and then they're like, yeah, this is fun. God, where are you? God, here, God, please come to me. It's like, you know what? Remember Moses when he prayed? He said, Lord, I do not want to leave this place unless if you move before me. <clears throat> don't go ahead of God. Desire for God's provision for our physical and spiritual needs. And the last thing in your prayer is that submission to God's authority above all other authorities. Submission to God's authority. I can see people having problems with authorities when they're having problems with God's authority in the church. Simple as that. Because if they don't submit to the body, to the head of Jesus, to the head of the church, and to the body of Christ, what makes them think they're going to submit to anybody but themselves? That's why the prayer says this, Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then it says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
yours. Everything is about you. It's yours. Although the prayers of the disciple of Jesus Christ is in the upper room was not specifically written, but I can sense the prayer that they're praying about. What were they praying about in the upper room? They were praying for God's will to be done. They were praying for the word of God to be fulfilled in their life. They were praying that the promise of God to be fulfilled whenever God has it ready. They were waiting on the Lord. That's why in chapter 2, in a couple weeks from now, you're going to see a very powerful display of God's power that no one has ever seen in the history of mankind. But this one. Prayer. Our prayer. Church, we're supposed to be all about prayer in the church. As fellowship, the body of Jesus Christ, we must continually pray to God. Pray through our life testimony here, serving the Lord together. Pray through the songs and praise. When we sing praises earlier, God, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Do you think that's just us from doing performance up here? I hope not. You know who's the audience every Sunday that's listening to the songs? The Lord Jesus Christ. Guess who make you who make you and me become one? We are choirs. We are God's choirs. Who's going to be pleased about that? Jesus Christ. I have people that come into church before that say, like, you know, I don't like the music in the church. Who cares if you like it or not? I don't know. I care if Jesus Christ likes it. <laughs> yes, music is just personal preferences. Some like reggae, some like download, Indonesians call it. <laughs> some call it the uh, whatever style, but listen. It's got to be about Jesus Christ, not about the taste of my body so I can move. It's all about Jesus Christ, isn't it? And if you want to worship God with your children like this, by all means, do it for Jesus Christ. David did that, the King David, what did he do? He was almost half naked, he was dancing on the street. And his wife, Michelle, was like, Ew. Remember that? And she was confronting him and said, like, what did you do? Do you know you're a king? What does David say? I was praising God. It was not about me. It was about Him. Praise the Lord. If you're going to praise the Lord with bowing down to the floor, do it by all means. Who cares what people say because it's about you worshiping the true living God. The songs we sing should be praises, a prayer of praises and worship. And then through our faithfulness in studying the Word of God and serving God, when we serve God together in the church, in the body, that is a worship, that is a prayer. A prayer is about the lifting up, saying, Jesus Christ, I serve you today because you are my God and I know you are alive. And when people come in here down, I want them to see the living Christ that is in me, even though I was just vacuuming the floor, even though I was just cleaning up the toilets. I have people that come visit our church in here pastors and friends that are visiting. I have a few people that say to me like this, uh, like, you know everyone, you should not do anything in the church. Let the people do it together. I agree to a certain degree. But let me tell you this, I just cannot help it. Because we are one. And when the body is moving, I cannot not move. I gotta move. Do you understand that? I cannot just sit still and like, hey, yeah, go ahead, Johnny, go ahead, good job, yeah, put the speakers up. Yes, there you go, you know. I just can't. Because I'm in Christ and you are in Christ, we're together. You move, I move. You cry, I cry. You laugh, we laugh. We're all one. I can't help it. I cannot. And for me not to serve the Lord with whatever that I have, even if I have a even if I have a fever, anything, as long as I can still move my legs, I will be there. This last week, Pastor Hodges' mom passed away. She was 88 years old. And uh, Amy and I watched it through the Facebook, the funeral service, and the testimonies and all that. You know, the church testified, uh, Pastor's mom, on this last Sunday, she came to church. She came and she did not have her hair done, which is a very not her at all. She always done her hair on Friday, that she's ready for church on Sunday. 
A few months before that, the doctor kept her in the hospital and told her, said, ma'am, you have to stay in the hospital, you cannot leave. And she said, like, doctor, I'll listen to you, but on Sunday morning, I'll be at church. And they said, ma'am, you cannot. He says, doctor, I believe you have everything. And she said, I'll be at church. She called her, her son, Pastor Rogers, pick her up, go to church with the IV thing hanging on her arm, and she plays the organ. After that, she said, son, take me back to the doctor because I, doctor want me to stay there. This last Sunday, before she passed away, she went to church, hair was not done. She come up there, she played the organ as always, serving the Lord, with a smile and all of that. Did not know that was the last time that she was going to be there. But you know what's amazing? In her life's testimony, that serving the Lord Jesus Christ never come to second or anything else. There was her life testimony. She is a godly woman who loved the Lord Jesus Christ more than anything. And no wonder her children, two of them, and her grandchildren, four of them, and her great-grandchildren, 12 of them, they all serve the Lord. Why? Because Granny loved the Lord Jesus Christ and never stopped serving the Lord no matter what. You know, if there's one thing I learned from her is that I will never get my sickness anything to get me beyond. Unless if I'm bleeding and all that, I'm not going to come to church. The last one, which is what brings us to the last one. The pillar of the fellowship. The pillar of the fellowship. Look at the last part of that church, the verse. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. Look at the last part. This is weird to me. With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Uh, what's up with that? What is, what's the purpose of writing the, the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers? I don't know how many of you know that the Lord Jesus Christ has some stepbrothers. All right. In Matthew 13 and Mark chapter 6, the names were mentioned in there. Listen to the names. There were James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Not, the, not Iscariot. Four brothers, stepbrothers of Jesus Christ. These four were younger than Jesus. And then, do you know that Jesus has sisters? Because in Mark chapter 6, verse uh, four, uh, 34, 35, and they mention about the women, the sisters. The Lord Jesus Christ has lead, at least have two sisters. Now, why did I mention that? Because that the name the, the name was not written, but look at it, it said the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They were the author, Luke, wrote it down. The family of Jesus Christ, the immediate family, were there. So here's the thing. What's so important about these people? Now get this. These individuals, the, the stepbrothers, Jesus himself, I mean the stepbrothers, the mother of Jesus, and the sisters, these all have seen Jesus Christ with their naked eyes. These have heard Jesus Christ directly. These have seen Jesus since he was like a little toddler, maybe, all the way to the grown up. They've seen Jesus all the way through. They have seen Jesus when he was being persecuted. They seen Jesus when he was crucified. Because when Jesus was on the cross, the Bible says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was there. And his brothers. I believe the sisters there too. But so the question is this. What is the purpose of Luke wrote these people names down, these women and the brothers? Because they were the pillar of the church. Not foundation, the pillar. A pillar is something of a structure that a building used to support, to get the building stand up. You understand this? So if there's anybody coming to the fellowship, they say like, you know what, your Jesus is dead. Your Jesus is nonsense. Your Jesus is not real. Guess who's gonna come up first? The mom. Listen, my name is Mary. I am, I was the one who gave birth to my son, Jesus, the Christ. I saw him when he was a baby. I saw him 
when he was crucified. I saw him when he rose from the dead. I saw him when he was ascended to heaven. You did not see him, but I have seen him. And then after that, I can see James and Joseph, the brother said, Brother Jesus, come up there. And he says, hey, by the way, what mom said, that was real. Because we all can stand here together and tell you that, that Jesus, that we worship, that Jesus, that we pray to, is alive. And you know what's so powerful about that, church? As I read that, there are your faces coming to my mind. The faces of you guys that have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ from the beginning of this church. That remain faithful. Not just faithful to read your Bible. I'm talking about faithful to testify the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully living for Christ. Faithfully serving the Lord in the body of Christ. You are the pillars of the church. Long time ago, I met a man and a husband and wife. The wife was a pastor in the church here down the road here. And they told me about the pillars of the church. One of the pillars was business. Money, you know, they have businessmen fellowship. Another pillar is the fellowship of I mean, the gathering of the youth and all of that. In my mind thinking like, oh wow, are those people really true believers or are they just a bunch of people who buy a my Lord? Because the pillars of the church are the people who have seen, who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So if someone coming here to say that your Jesus is nonsense, your Jesus is impossible, I pray that you guys who have been in Christ for so long in this church, at least for almost 10 years, or 9 years, or 8 years, 7 years, 5 years, whatever it is, that you will stand up to say like, man, listen, I have seen, I have tasted and seen that my God is good, that He is real. That you are the pillars of the church. The fellowship of the church, it rests upon you guys. The fellowship of the church rests upon you. Not on the pastor only. On each one individual. So church, in conclusion of this message, I want you to see this, what John has said in this letter. 1 John chapter 1, last verse is always read. Verse 1 to 3. This is John's testimony, the beloved of Jesus. In verse 1, in chapter 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, watch this, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled or touched, and concerning the word of life, not the concerning just about the Jesus, the physical Jesus, but the word of life, that the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. We have seen it. We have touched it. We have seen everything. We have known that which we have seen and have heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. You see that the pillars? The fellowship, the pillars of the fellowship are the believers who have tasted and seen, that have seen Jesus Christ, that have lived with Christ, that have experienced God in their lives. So let me ask you this. This is nothing to be embarrassed about. How many of you here with an honest heart to say, I have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. I have tasted and seen that God is good. How many of you can raise your hand that way? Now get this. If you're a member of the body of Christ here, you are the pillars of the church. Look at the last part in verse 3. That which you have seen and heard declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly, watch this, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So why do we come in here together today? Because we are going to, we are fellowshipping right now with Jesus Christ. You're not here just to fellowship with one another. We are here fellowshipping with our Lord Jesus Christ, right here, right now. Today, I have seen and I have tasted the goodness of the Lord in this very place. 
And if you have not, there's something that's not right in your heart. And there's something not right in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if you have not seen that, you may not walk in with God through like you should. You may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ if you don't see that the Lord through is good. Would you please bow your heads in the attitude of prayer? Christians, members of RBC Central, I want to invite you this morning to pray with me for us to commit to God, to Jesus Christ our Lord, the head of the church, to say, Lord, we're going to persevere, persevere in the fellowship, that we're not gonna, we're not going to take an absent or anything, we're not going to grow weary in the fellowship of the body of Christ, we're going to persevere because you are the living Christ and I and you are one, Lord. Can you make that commitment with me today, this morning, in prayer? Persevere together in fellowship. Faithfully prayer. Pray faithfully, desiring Jesus Christ and His glory to be revealed. Ask God, God, would you please reveal your glory to me, to my life right now in our midst. Lord, if I have no sin, that there is a sin in my life that I need to deal with, Lord. I need to deal with that. Perhaps you need to get down on your knees and say, Lord, please forgive me. I have something that is not right in my heart. I have sinned against you and I have sinned against someone in my life that I should not, that have hindered me to see your glory being revealed right here in the body of Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive me. And I want you to commit with me if you would this morning also to faithfully testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. To say, Lord, I have known you for quite some time now. I have heard about you. I have seen you. God, thank you for making me as the pillars of the church. To testify you, Lord. But I want to commit even more right now. In this year 2020. For me to step out. Step out of my comfort zone and to step into the body of Christ like I should. To live and move and have my being with Jesus Christ, my Lord. Would you pray that together with me this morning? I desire to see more of the glory of Jesus Christ and His power in the church and in my life. How about you? Do you desire that? Perhaps you're this morning, you're here. You have gone to many different churches. You probably think that church is just some kind of social gathering. Church is everything is the same. I want to challenge you this morning. I want you to see church through the church of Jesus Christ. Right here. I'm not going to force you to believe in Jesus Christ. I want you to see Jesus Christ first, right here in our midst. I want you to experience the Lord Jesus Christ with us together. I want to invite you, come continually, to experience Christ with us. Because church is not about a man or an organization, but it's about Jesus Christ. Would you please pray with me this morning as I talk? Father God, as I come before you this morning together again, with this body, of your body, the church, Lord, you have spoken to us this morning to reveal to us what church is should be like, what church is all about. Lord God, forgive us when we have been growing weary in doing church and forgetting that we who have been bought by the blood of Christ, been redeemed from our sins, and been united in Jesus Christ, that we are the body of Christ. Oh, Lord God, forgive us if we have forgotten that. Lord, forgive us, for we have been so much want to be in control of what we want to get, to get done, but not submitting to your authority, to submitting to your power, Lord. And because of that, God, Sometimes we miss out to see the glory that you have revealed again and again, every Sunday, every time we get together. 
Lord, I pray. I pray, Father, if there is any sins in the hearts of your people this morning, in the church, that will be dealt with right away. If there are any sins that need to be confessed, Father, I pray that will be confessed right now. Because you continue to reveal your glory to us. And God, we do not want to miss it. We do not want to miss you. Father God, I pray for those who are here today, who are visiting, those who uh, do not know Jesus Christ perhaps, for those of them maybe been religious, growing up in churches, and seeing a lot of things being done right, wrong, and all that stuff. God, I pray that there will be true with you, that there will desire to see the true church of Jesus Christ. That they will want to continue to testify to you right here in this body because this is your body. Obviously, Central is the body of the living Christ. Father God, I pray, may the unity of this church will not be interrupted or hindered. We pray that Satan will not have any doing in this body to disunite what you have united together. Let no man put asunder what you have joined together. So may it will be done, Father God, I pray. I praise you and thank you in Jesus Christ and all God's people say. I pray that you have a different understanding now of what church is truly about. And so you understand where I'm coming from when I speak to you about church. Because that's what my understanding about church from the very beginning. From the very day one when IBC Central, about almost 10 years ago, it was all about Jesus Christ, nothing about me. I just have the privilege that God called me to be a part of this work. And by the way, the church, IBC Central, does not rest upon me. I know with confidence with this, that if I were to die tomorrow, that God called me home. That the church will continue until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Because this is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, not the church of Pastor Lord. Thank you for allowing me to deliver that message to you. I pray that you would listen and take it home with you, this message that you just heard. This will be on the, our website. You can look at it and in, uh, in the ibccentral.nz, our website. By the way, keep that in mind. Uh, Dean keep reminding us that our church website is no longer .org.nz, but it's now ibccentral. Dog, NZ, just go NZ, okay? Um, I appreciate Dean doing all of that work, putting on announcements, everything. The bulletin is there, and uh, everything else you need to know, announcements is all in there, all right? So uh, keep that in mind. Church, uh, there's something that's going to happen, uh, just a little family meeting here, very quickly. Uh, that we are, uh, we, this is our second Sunday to the last Sunday we are meeting here, okay? So next Sunday, will be our last Sunday meeting here in this building, this facility. We're going to be meeting across the street at the War Memorial Hall right there, uh, right next to KFC. So if you missed up where it is, you must hate KFC a lot. <laughs> so we're meeting in there. Our church will be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. All right? Eddie is going to re-emphasize that again. But here's the thing. If you notice later on, you look at to the left side here in the parking lot, we have a church trailer. That means that all of these equipments that we have is going to be packed in there right after the service. We're going to pack up everything, store it in there, locked up, and then we're going to take it with us. They do not want us to leave our equipments anymore in here. That also goes with anything you leave here. Your Bible, if you leave your Bible, your jackets, your genitals, your shoes, you're not going to see it again. Okay, because the, the new owner have taken the ownership of this building, they're taking everything out slowly. You notice the chair changed colors now? The black chair has already been taken away. Okay, eventually next week probably going to see less things in here. So, I uh, just want to give you a heads up on that. However, with that said, we're going to be doing a lot more works in setting up and taking down things. That's going to take us the whole body to do this, alright? Uh, when we meeting over there, we start at 2 o'clock for the service, but we can only go into that building at 115 sharp, 115. So we only have 45 minutes before the church starts. And before that, there's another church meeting over there every Sunday. That means that there will be a traffic in and out. They have to dismantle their stuff, we have to install our stuff. So with that, we need all hands on deck. 
family, church, one body. Together, set up everything. You know, we cannot be just Eddie and Isabella anymore just doing chairs because for the last uh, seven years we've been here almost, most of the time it's just Eddie and Isabella setting up chairs. I don't know they don't want to be mentioned, but I just have to because we're a family together, right? <laughs> They've been setting up chairs, you know, and praise the Lord, uh, never complain anything because they love the Lord, they want to serve it. So let's do this together, okay? We've got to have the set of chairs and the equipment. You know, now, you know, John Lee is going to be a daddy soon. It could be any this week, okay? <laughs> and that means when he becomes a new daddy, uh, he's going to be a little bit going that way, you know, and so uh, we need help also in setting up this. I'll leave it up all that to the deacons to arrange it, so uh, if you want to help out anything, talk to either to David or to Eddie or to Jolly, talk to them about it, you know, how and on the, all of the, how to get together, all right? So what we're doing next week is we're going to bring the trailer we brought up here, we're going to unload everything, set up, after that we pack up everything, we go, okay? That's what we call it the Old Testament way, the tabernacle way, okay? Set up, go, set up, go. And then someone in the back mentioned it's going to be 40 years. <laughs> I said, no, hopefully just 40 hours or 40 days, okay? <laughs> that was the area you said. Okay, so we don't want to do that, all right? Another thing, church, family, uh, our ministries. We have many opportunities for ministries, all right? Uh, the children ministry, it's lacking of individuals, teachers, all right? Uh, we need that. The reason, this is something, why, why don't we have any children ministry during the summer break? Because the last year, and every year going on, there were four individuals to six individuals that are doing this for 40 weeks or uh, 45 weeks or so like that. You notice the one that was missing in the church usually the one who been doing it. In other words, that if you have more people that want to teach the Word of God to the children, that will be less of that, okay? So we give them the break this month and a half for them just to be able to come enjoy the fellowship, the church and all of that. But if you want to be a part of the children's ministry, come see Isabella, Eddie, or see uh, Nicola for the creation ministry or see Amy. Okay, talk to one of them. Talk to them, you know, maybe it's only once every two weeks or once every uh, four weeks that way. The more people, the, the lighter it becomes, okay? And uh, man, if I have the opportunity to serve children in uh, the children's ministry, I would love to. It's fun. It's good. All right. Children are so easy. Easier than adults. <laughs> not always. Behave your wife, maybe not, but, you know, anyway. Guys, let's serve the Lord faithfully. Let's continue worshiping the Lord.